Uh, welcome to tonight's discussion. Um, it's a joint event between the Philosophy Society and UCD Islam Islamic Society. Um, tonight's topic is, is, what is the point in believing in God? Um, I'd like to welcome our speakers tonight. Um, if we could all show our appreciation by giving them a round of applause. Um, the speakers in order this evening um, will be um, Dr. Dan Deasy of the UCD Philosophy Department. We have um, international, uh, uh, sorry, international um, speaker and um, Muslim intellect, um, Al Abdullah in Al Andalusi. Um, then we, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, um, and then we have uh, UC UCD um, Church of Ireland chaplain. Um, Scott Evans, uh, and finally we have Catherine Byrne, um, the uh, student atheist and secular affairs, uh, sorry, a student atheist um, who's involved in secular affairs on campus, uh, who also incidentally uh, runs a show in uh, UC Belfield FM. Uh, it's a comedy show, um, so she said just be aware that there might be some jokes. Uh, <laughs> make sure you laugh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, great, okay. Um, thanks very much, guys. Um, so the format for the, this evening is that each speaker will speak for approximately seven to 10 minutes. Um, this will be followed by a Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, please refrain from, them, from asking them when the speakers are speaking. Instead, take a note of them, and during the Q&A, hopefully we'll get to everybody who has a question. Um, I'd ask that you could keep your questions reasonably short, um, just so that everybody has a chance to kind of voice their uh, opinions or anything that they might want to ask. Um, great. Um, so on that note, I would like to um, uh, invite um, Dr. Dan DC up to the platform to, for his speech. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to uh, Phil Sock and I Sock for um, inviting me to speak at this very interesting event. Um, so I'm going to be sort of characteristically philosophical and um, sort of turn the question around a little bit and think about what the question means and think about some of the implications of answering the question in different ways. Um, the question being, uh, what's the point in believing in God? Um, so the first interesting thing is even just the terminology used in this question, believing in, um, we don't... We, we usually talk about believing in when there's some doubt or something about the thing that we believe in, right? So we think uh, children believe in Father Christmas. Um, some children believe in the Tooth Fairy. Um, and we talk about people believing in God as well. Um, and it seems to suggest a certain kind of reluctance to say something a bit stronger. And I, I, I'm actually more interested in the stronger thing. So I'm going to interpret the question as not what is the point in believing in God, but what is the point in believing that God exists? So this is a bit of a stronger thing to say, okay, I believe that God exists, not just I believe in God. Um, so I'm not just talking about faith, um, I'm talking about belief in a proposition about the existence of a particular thing. I'm talking about believing that there is this thing, it is God, it is the deity uh, that is omnipotent, omniscient, uh, um, and so on. Um, now, what is the point? in believing that there is uh, a God. Well, there's, I mean, there are, again, different ways of taking this. Um, there are reasons to believe in things that are pragmatic. So you might think um, that for some people, it's good to believe that God exists because it brings them comfort and makes them happy. And you might even say, in your own case, a reason for me to believe that God exists is that it brings comfort and happiness to my life. Um, whether, in general, uh, we ought to believe that God exists uh, on the grounds that it brings us comfort and happiness is an empirical question. For some people, it does bring them comfort and happiness. Uh, for other people, uh, it might not. It might bring them anxiety. It might cause uh, strife in various ways. So it seems to me to be an open and really an empirical question about whether we, in general, people, ought to believe that God exists uh, on the basis that it has uh, good effects for our lives. Um, another kind of reason for believing that something is the case is just the straightforward uh, epistemological way. So, you know, in the same way that um, 
you know, you, 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 you don't believe that Father Christ... I'm going to assume you don't all... None of you believe that Father Christmas exists. Um, you don't believe... I'm sorry. Um, uh, um, bombshell. Um, you, you don't believe that. And, uh, you know, it, it might be the case that believing that would make you feel better and make your life happier, but you still don't believe it. You don't believe it because you would find it irrational to believe that. You don't have justification for believing it. So let's kind of focus on that notion of belief Belief based on good reasons, on evidence, belief that you would consider to be rationally justified. Uh, the reasons that you have for not believing in Father Christmas, for example. Now you might ask yourself, is belief that God exists justified in that sense? Is, are there good reasons to believe in the rational sense, in the epistemic sense, uh, that there is such a thing as God? Um, and uh, I think... A big mistake that I so I, I, the thing I, the point the main point I want to make today is that it's I think it's wrong for religious believers uh, to say that their religious belief their belief that God exists does not have that kind of justification. So I'm in a way going to argue against faith. <laughs> um, I'm going to argue against. Uh, a religious believer taking the position that their religious belief, their belief in the existence of God, is something that they can't provide evidence or justification for in the same way you would provide evidence or justification in a court case or if someone asked you whether it's raining outside or some other matter of fact. Um, the reason that you might think as a religious believer that you have to sort of, as it were, retreat to faith or to irrationality or to something else or to the feeling of happiness that religious belief gives you, uh, our first sense of justification, is just that um, there's no evidence that you can give that's going to convince someone who isn't a religious believer. Right? So take yourself to be a religious believer and think, well, what evidence would you give for your belief that God exists? Well, the most natural kinds of evidence would seem to me to be, uh, for example, religious testimony. Uh, the testimony of your peers, the testimony of your parents, the testimony of uh, the authorities uh, that you recognize within your religion, the testimony of uh, various written sources, and uh, religious experience, religious experience that you might have, certain particular kinds of experiences that you have under certain circumstances, which you would identify as religious experiences, and which you would say, give me a reason to believe. Now, if I, as a religious believer, present those to a non-believer, they're likely to say, oh, well, this is just question begging. It's not a religious experience unless what you, what you say this is evidence for is already true. In other words, you, I can't count this as a religious experience because I don't believe that God exists. So the experience you're describing isn't a religious experience. That's not really part of the evidence. Uh, the testimony, of course, I say this is reliable testimony from the scriptures or from uh, the whatever relevant texts or from my peers. Well, the, non, the non-believer will say, no, uh, it's not reliable testimony because it's testimony based on false premises or on false information or delusion or something like that. The point I want to make is most strongly here, as a religious person, uh, and as it happens I'm not a religious person, you shouldn't retreat to faith in those kinds of circumstances. You should accept sometimes that the evidence that you give for your belief is not evidence that your opponents will accept, and that's perfectly fine. It isn't the case that all evidence is neutral in some debate. So, you know, we, we, we typically think of evidence as being like the knife in a, the bloody knife in a murder case. Right? There's a bloody knife. Did Smith commit the murder? Well, Smith's fingerprints are on the knife and there's blood on the end of the knife. Jones's, Jones's blood is on the knife. Right? It's a piece of evidence, but it's, as it were, a neutral piece of evidence because the two sides can give different explanations. One side can say, well, Jones touched it last week and Smith fell on it. <laughs> uh, it's a kind of implausible thing to say, but anyway. And the other side can say, no, Jones held it and stabbed Smith. Right? But the, the fact that there's a bloody knife is sort of neutral between those two stories. Maybe when we're debating about whether God exists, there isn't that kind of evidence. There isn't neutral evidence that you can give as a religious believer for your beliefs that's going to convince someone who doesn't believe you. That's perfectly fine. That just means that it's the kind of debate where such evidence isn't necessarily available. Okay, so this is really, I'm, in a sense I'm arguing against faith, but I'm, I'm not arguing against faith as a uh, characteristic type of experience you can have. I'm arguing against 
as a religious believer, the retreat to neutral evidence or to faith instead of justifying your beliefs. Okay, I want to make a, a final point because I'm probably quite low on time. Okay, I want to make one more point. What's the consequence if there isn't a, a way of convincing our opponents, other sides, whether they're people of different faiths or people of no faith, What's the consequence if there isn't this kind of evidence available in these cases? What do, we, what do we conclude? Well, one thing we can do is we can lead by example. So we can try to be rational as possible within our own spheres of belief. So we may have premises that our opponents will never accept. We may have premises that our opponents will never accept and they're the only premises we could ever use to convince them. So we'll never convince them. But we can at least be rational given our own premises. So we can try to be rational within our own sphere of belief, as it were. Another thing we can do is we can provide people, even if we can't convince them to believe what we believe, we can provide them with paths to knowledge. So I can at least show you that if you accept these things, then you can come to conclude other things, other things that I believe. Now, it might not be immediate that the person will accept the first things, but at least you can say, hey, look, um, you know, um, having, you know, um, for example, faith uh, provides all sorts of comforts, and you can show that, th that faith provides these comforts, and then, you know, a person might say, well, okay, uh, the comforts are dependent on the truth of the, the conclusion that there is this kind of, that there is a, a God, or, or, or uh, various other religious things. But I can show you how you can come to that conclusion, at least, if you accept these other things. And the final point, and I guess the most important one, is that there, there isn't really any point in arguing. Uh, if, if we really are in a, in a situation where it isn't possible to convince the other side using uh, premises and using arguments that the other side can accept, uh, there really is no point in arguing. There's no point, if you're an atheist, in being a Dawkins-like figure because you're not going to ever convince someone uh, to give up their religious faith. It is a pointless exercise. Uh, and if you're a religious person, there is no point in arguing with atheists. Uh, generally speaking, the best you can do is provide them with uh, a route to believing what you believe. But arguing with someone is not going to convince them. Um, not if they don't already accept your premises. Um, yeah, that's the point I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Firstly, I'd like to thank the uh, UCD Student Union, Islamic Society, and Philosophical Society for inviting me back here to speak. I'd also like to thank the moderator for getting my name right. It tends to not always be the case. I, I'd also like to remark that I always enjoy coming back, from, uh, coming back to Ireland, coming back to Dublin, and I will savour it all the more until... Britain undergoes a Brexit, where I might have to get a visa to come back here. <laughs> but on the bright side, at least I will give the um, Irish border security officers something to do now. <laughs> the topic today is, what is the point of believing in God? I found that a very interesting question. What is the point? I mean, a couple of months ago, the British people asked, what's the point of the EU? And then when the Brexit was voted for, people then asked, what's the point of David Cameron? <laughs> and then when he resigned, and now the British currency is the worst performing currency in the world in terms of uh, depreciation, now um, everyone's asking what's the point of Britain. <laughs> <laughs> now to do, do with this question, I think that before we answer it, we have to first ask what's the point in believing in anything at all? Well, surely the existence of something should be sufficient cause to believe in it. We believe in black holes, distant star clusters whose light hasn't yet reached us. We believe in the Big Bang. We believe in the common origin of animal life. And we also believe in the fact that the world is four billion years old. Why do we believe in those things? We believe in those things because these are realities, or these theories, detected despite the fact that they were detected without us directly observing them. 
but rather we detected them by observing and measuring the effects they produced. We also see the point of believing in them because they explain what preceded us and led to the circumstances uh, that we exist in today. And we do all this despite the fact that knowing any one of those things conveys absolutely no material benefit or useful effect to current day human life. Believing in the Big Bang or not, or black holes or distant clusters of stars or the age of the Earth doesn't really convey in and of itself any useful material benefit to technology, to uh, software, to economics today for humans. But we believe in it nonetheless because we believe that this is part of the reality that we've detected. Let's take energy. The point about believing in energy is because energy is a concept used in science to describe an observed phenomena of things that change, move and affect each other, whose sum of all their effects between mass, heat, light and other wavelengths of radiation within any closed system doesn't increase or decrease. We do this despite the fact that we cannot see or define energy, and we do this despite the fact that we can't even define energy. It's, a, it's an abstract concept. God is also something that we do not see. Yet like energy, we use a label to describe what caused an observable effect. This observable effect, I'd argue, is our finite reality we call the observable universe. The concept of God arises unavoidably when we ask why there exists a universe of changing and finite things rather than there being nothing at all. The only possible explanation that is rational and self-consistent is that all of finite existence, of which the observable universe may only be a small part, and all of its internal changes and arrangements must have been created by something else. If a stone wasn't formed from cooling lava, meteorite, meteorite strikes, weathering, or by artificial hands, would it have any shape? Well, no, because it wouldn't have been caused, it wouldn't have had an origin, and therefore it simply wouldn't exist, it being a finite object. As in an object that exists within finite boundaries, size, shape, mass, and so on and so forth. Likewise, our reality, if it was never caused by anything, why does it exist? Or why does it have the particular amounts and measurements and arrangement that it has? Who or what determined it? Who or what shaped it? Now, if my journey from London to Dublin today had taken an infinite amount of time and required the plane to traverse an infinite amount of distance, would I ever arrive in Dublin? No. Although, considering how long I had to walk in Dublin Airport, I think Dublin Airport is a good case for an infinite uh, distance. But likewise, we know that a changing universe had a beginning, because if it was eternal, we'd have to wait an infinite amount of time to reach any moment of existence. Consequently, this moment in time and all of us would never exist. Furthermore, what's the essence of the smallest subatomic particle? What's it made out of? Again, if there were an infinite series of babushka doll-like particles, each smaller and smaller and smaller within each other, ad infinitum, well, no particles would ever really exist. At some point, we have to concede that something is sustaining all matter and energy, whatever energy is. Therefore, the only explanation is that we detect the necessity of an unchanging, infinite, initiating force, or let's say first cause, which ultimately created our finite reality and also sustains it. This force is infinite, unchanging, and without shape, rendering it the exact opposite of a finite thing, and therefore in no need of predecessors to define it. It is therefore obvious what the point of believing in God is, and that is because God simply exists. You don't have to call it God, you can just call it the infinite force, the first cause, however wherever you want to define it. Where, whatever label you choose, it's still an existential thing. And just like humans possess the desire to discover the physical processes involved in creating their immediate circumstances, humans too want to know the ultimate force that created them, as well as the physical processes that we all hold in awe. There is also another point that the belief in God yields to humans, and that is meaning. If human life had no intention behind it, then human life, experience, actions and works have no meaning and have no point to them. 
a car that you get that gets you from A to B is generally a good car. A car that breaks down frequently is a bad car. Good and bad can only be understood by measuring an action according to whether it fulfills the intention or purpose behind a thing. If humans were not intended, then there is no good and bad because human life has no point. I'm not saying that this makes massacres, killing, colonization, and exploitation become good. No. The point is that in having no meaning to human life, it makes these actions nothing at all. However, since the creator of the universe being the first cause was not compelled by any internal or external mechanism to create the universe and us, it being the first cause, it tells us that God intended to create us and everything that exists and, and that happened after was intended. This gives us meaning and a point to all our actions. It is then for humans to seek to discover what that point is. In asking what the point of believing in God is, we can arrive at the point of human life. Because the real question we should have first asked is not what is the point in believing in God, but what is the point of human life and everything that exists. Thank you. Fine, none taken. <laughs> cool. So I am apparently the token, the token leprechaun that we kind of stick up when we need somebody to be slightly, um, I don't know, kind of controversial, shall we say? I'm glad I'm not the only sort of secular person. I was a wee bit worried about that, and you know, kind of waiting for people to chase me out of the room with hurley sticks uh, later on. So actually. Um, that's the thing though, I'm not really used to speaking to people in this forum because I'm used to sitting, talking to myself in the radio station, um, kind of slowly going insane. Um, so it's kind of nice to see humans um, <laughs> once in a while. Um, in terms of my experience with religion, it's sort of you know the usual primary school religion classes straight through the third year sort of stuff, fairly basic and all the rest of it. In terms of philosophy, I'm doing two <coughs> modules this semester, so that's sort of my own experience with that. One of my modules is actually Dan's module, so if you would like to give me an A, it would be much appreciated. <laughs> like if we can have a wee chat and arrange that later. Um, so, we'll get started. Um, I'm choosing to talk about this in the most simple terms possible. I reckon it's more of a kind of discussion sometimes about personal views as opposed to just necessarily just representing kind of the the uh, a main groups kind of thing so we're going to go with my thing look at you um i've decided to define god as sort of a superhuman being or um spirit that we kind of worship as having control over nature or human fortune um, in terms of what the point in believing in God is, I reckon that's personal um, and it's about what it does maybe for you. Um, so when I was researching this, I decided to have a look at what the benefits were and what the negatives were and all the rest of it. And what I managed to find when I googled what are the benefits of believing in God was a website called mysquirrelbait.com. That was actually the first thing up on Google and I was kind of impressed by it because I reckoned I was going to discover a website where I was going to find out how to catch squirrels and keep them and hug them and love them forever. Um, that wasn't what I got, but what I did get was a list of what the basics were for believing in a Christian God in terms of a benefit. Um, I'm not just going to look at the benefits of a Christian one, I'm more so interested in what the general benefits are of believing in a God within any sort of religious context um, and what I find or what I found rather was there's the belief that it's a directing force in their life um, it provides inner peace it helps you to make large or small decisions when you've got somebody guiding you um, it sort of brings you peace of mind as well um, it also helps you to follow a straight and narrow path in terms of it means you've got a moral compass that you're supposed to follow, that you can follow. 
and also it allows for many of the difficult questions to be answered. Um, if that's what helps and if that's what gives you some meaning, I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, I'm going to take the agnostic approach of saying I would like to believe there is something but I'm not necessarily sure and I'm sure maybe someday we will have the means by which to you know, prove it but, um, or disprove it but we just don't have that now. Um, in terms of why I think there might not be a point in believing in God, um, to help us feel significant, I think we're all individually significant and important. Um, obviously there's some flowers of the special variety and we don't always think that they're super duper important and all the rest of it, but they are. And everybody has some importance and using this superhuman being or super whatever being, superpower, to show you yourself sort of thing that you're that you are important, that you have some significance. I don't necessarily think that's the right way to go about it because I think that's something you should be believing about yourself in the first place anyway. Um, in terms of using it as a moral compass, um, human nature I think is complicated. It's varied. Um, there are lots of terrible, horrible people. I'm a horrible people person, rather, at 5am. Um, but also there's some good in human nature. And if you want to use religion as maybe a way to, depending on obviously what the religious beliefs are and all the rest of it, um, as a way to guide yourself to, to move towards making the better human nature sort of decisions, that you're going to do the nice thing instead of the bad thing, that's kind of cool. Um, and maybe if you want to use that as a point of believing in God, you believe in God, God has this set of rules, but then maybe uh, religion, and you're going to do the nice stuff. Um, it can sometimes mean, though, if you do believe in a God, that you sometimes ostracise people. Um, don't shoot me. Uh, basically, I think... It depends on kind of, obviously, the, the religion and that, but sometimes if you're super religious or if, you, if you're super passionate about everything, it sometimes blocks you off from wanting to listen to other people's ideas and things like that, and it means sometimes you don't get to learn um, lots of nice things and cool things and all the rest of it and it means that you push yourself away from meeting lots of wonderful individuals that you might not necessarily usually get to chat to. Um, it also means that if we sort of just accept the idea that there is a God and we don't question it, we might not necessarily question the things and we might not learn the things that we have learned in so far as science might not progress and all the rest of it. Our discoveries might not kind of have happened if we weren't sitting there questioning things and wondering why, why, why. Um, the final thing is... Doo -doo -doo. I kind of shouldn't have chosen such a small font. Mm -hmm. Doo -doo -doo. Yeah. Um, the last thing is... Um, I actually managed to find a quote from um, the professor Roger Trigg, who teaches in Oxford University, and he did a study whereby he discovered it's actually human nature to want to find a religion. But he said that we see an agency, we think there's something there, even if you can't see it. Um, so obviously, like he's pushing towards the whole. Um, there may well be a God, but what he did find is that just because... So the project... He was talk, sorry, he was talking about the project. He said, the project does not set out to prove God or gods exist, but we find it easier to think, about a, to think in a particular way doesn't mean necessarily that it's true. So if it's helping us as a, you know, as a moral compass or whether it's helping us find some meaning in our lives um, in terms of the significance and making us feel important and worthy. There's no problem with that, and maybe that could be a point to believing in it. <coughs> but if it's a case that it's limiting you or it's, 
belief is sort of um, making you not question things and just accept things, and it's letting you ostracize people, even if you don't necessarily mean to. There's another way of thinking about it. Okay, I'm going to do that. Good evening. Real lively group tonight. Good to see you all. Um, so my name is Scott. A uh, couple uh, little pieces of business, first of all. Um, one is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about a framework for my faith. That framework is also in a book that I've written called Closer Still. And there's a bunch of copies of it down there. If anyone wants one for free afterwards, you're welcome to them. I'm not selling anything. Um, uh, I am giving it away if you want it. Um, I'm the Church of Ireland chaplain here in UCD. I'm in the old student centre. Um, and there's also an event coming up next month um, that I'll quickly plug. We're doing um, uh, a weekend called Plunge. And what it is is it's a multifaceted approach to self-care. So we're doing a weekend of um, surf, sea, and silence up on the north coast. It's going to be meditation, mindfulness, lecture divina, Ignatian spirituality, and surfing. Um, and uh, time spent in an old man pub down the road. Um, and the cost. I've figured out a way to get it subsidized. So I think it's going to be about 50 euro for students who want to come along, including accommodation food and surfing. Um, so it's going to be a pretty dynamite weekend looking at like your physical self, your emotional self, your spiritual self all together. Um, so uh, just drop me an email scott.evans at ucd.ie if you're interested in that. Okay, business over. As I was thinking about preparing for this, um, I come back to a place that I've often come back to when it comes to conversations about faith. And, that the, that, and that's that there's a certain arrogance to trying and, and, and possibly a certain kind of duplicitousness about trying to justify what I subjectively believe. The truth is that I don't, I, I did not think to myself, there is a point, it is functional to believe in God and then started to believe in God. I believe in God and it's transformed my life and therefore I think there's a point to it. I came at this the other way around, what you in the philosophy world might call ass backwards. <laughs> This is not an objective issue for me. The truth is that I grew up in a family of people who were Christians. I grew up in a country that was at least nominally, nominally Christian before I actually moved to Bangladesh when I was seven. So, and also grew up in an Islamic country. Um, but my family background and, and, and my faith background, the two have been linked from the beginning of my life. I didn't do an analysis of all the world religions and decide this one is the most objectively verifiable and now I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian and I've wrestled with that and I've come to it and I've moved from it. But my faith isn't utilitarian. I don't believe in it because it's functional. And I don't always find it easy to believe in it either. I grew up kind of, I'm, I would say that I'm a recovering fundamentalist who's becoming a mystic. When I was a child, I always believed that God was real. I just didn't believe that he was, I didn't particularly believe that he was good. Now I find, I always believe that God is good. I'm just not always sure he's real. And it's a different way to come to it, and it's a different way to come at it, because it sits with the mystery that I can no, no more prove this to you than I can prove it to myself. And very often my attempts to prove it to you are actually just attempts to prove it to myself, because I can't do that either. You see, doubt and faith, they go hand in hand. They're part of wrestling. That's one of the things I love about the Christian tradition, is that the, reason, the way the world, Israel, comes into um, the, the Judeo-Christian story is because there was a man called Jacob, and Jacob took what was not his. His name means to supplant, to take what isn't his. And Israel means to wrestle with God. It's a transformation in his identity. And the wrestling with God is part of it for me. Because having a mindless faith, a faith that doesn't question, a faith that doesn't doubt, I think is one of the most damaging things in the world. Very often I say to students who I, who I work with in kind of spiritual development, is that if you've never questioned your exi the existence of God, you, you either underestimate the suffering the world is experiencing, or you don't care. Because when we're confronted with that, it can't help but make us ask those questions. And yet, I still continue to believe. So I can only argue what the point I see in me believing in God is. And why I find it to be quantifiably better for myself and for the world for me to believe in God. But I also think there are different types of belief. 
I think there is a way of believing that is objectively destructive and that harms those in the world around you. It, it's the kind of fundamentalism that turns the holy texts of whatever religion into a sword with which to hack other people to death and to build on the ascent to power so that you can dominate the world. And I think there's an objectively beautiful way to live, and that is to see your scriptural texts as a scalpel that does the work to remove, to excise the cancerous and the toxic parts of yourself that have a tendency to destroy your life and the lives of those around you. Instead of this being a way of ascent, it's the way of descent. The way of becoming less. The way of becoming transformed. For me, my faith is part of... It, it forms a framework for my understanding of the human experience. A framework for me dealing with what all of us deal with in terms of how we feel about what it means to be human and why it matters. In the beginning of the Bible, it's, we have the book of Genesis. And there are crazy people among my faith who believe in literal six-day creation. I'm sorry if you believe that. Maybe that's not fair. I don't believe that. And it's also not what remotely interests me about the text. The text begins with God creating the world in six days, and he creates man and woman in his image. And then he leaves them, and there's this fruit in the garden. And, they, and the most interesting part of, this, of the story for me is that they begin the story naked, and they, they go to the one thing that they were told not to do. And they exercise their agency. They reach up and they take it. And they bite into the fruit, whatever it was. It doesn't say it was an apple. Could have been anything. Could have been a lychee. I don't know. But they reach up and they take it. And as soon as they take it, something happens within them. And they make clothes for themselves. And they run into the woods to hide from themselves and from each other. And to hide from God. And the beautiful thing about this story for me is not, it's not whether... Sorry. But... Um, the thing that fascinates me about the story is not whether or not that's literal, whether or not that actually happened. What fascinates me is that in myself, I find it still happening. That in the moments where I seek to be like God, in the moments where I seek to, t to exercise my power over the world or to become a destructive force in the world, I realize and I feel ashamed and I run into the woods and I cover myself and I pretend to be something that I'm not. For me, my faith is the way in which it is turned as a scalpel against my shame so that I can actually find a way of being in a way that helps me love myself and in turn love others. It teaches me wisdom. It teaches me the tension of wrestling. Sometimes we talk about, you know, someone will say something dumb like the Bible says, right? The Bible says a lot of things. And some of them are contradictory, but in the most beautiful way possible. What does the Bible say about the heart? It says that the heart, you said, it says you should guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. But it also says you shouldn't trust it because it's deceitful above all things. How do those two coexist? Well, if you're looking at it from a purely rational perspective, trying to argue its truth, it can't be done, but if you look at it from a mystical perspective, it says, of course, that's true. That's true in every relationship in my life. My heart is my wellspring of life, and yet at the same time, it leads me down dangerous and destructive roads. I don't believe in Christianity, and I don't believe in God, because it's objective light, objectively verifiable. Me and Dan are on the exact same page on that. I believe in it because it's beautiful and because it's changed everything. And in that beauty, I find myself loving myself more, loving others more, when it is turned within myself as a scalpel, rather than turned against others like a sword. Um, so I'd like to thank all of the speakers this evening. I think we can all agree that all of their speeches were thoroughly enlightening and um, extremely entertaining. Um, so um, at this point, I'm going to open up um, to the floor for a Q&A. Um, if you can raise your hand if you have a question, I'll select questions. We'll try and get to as many as we possibly can. Again, if you can try to keep them as short as possible, um, that would be helpful so we can get to as many questions as much as possible. And, and when you ask your question, if it's, like, if it's for everybody, you can say that, or if it's for the entire panel, please pass when you're asking when you're asking a question. Um, so on that note, um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, Sophie? Um, I'd like to ask uh, the panel what they think of uh, Pascal's religion. I don't know if that's the um, philosophy you said, uh, but um, that you're better off believing in God or at least making the average signs of believing in God because you get to the end of your life. And there is no God, then you haven't really lost anything. And if, if there is God, then you're in clover. Um, I don't know. Personally, I think if there was a God, then he'd send you for help to help be a smart guy. But I'm not sure.
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know the debate about Pascal's wager very well in particular. As I understand it, you know, there are reasons to think it's not such a great argument. Um, but um, aside from those reasons, which might be of a sort of semi-technical nature about, you know, what you should believe when there's a very small chance. So the whole, the premise, the idea of the argument is that there's a very small chance, there's a small, there's, it's, there's a small chance that, that, that you're going to really have, there's going to be a disaster for you of infinite torment, um, and you shouldn't risk the infinite torment by doing something which, after all, doesn't cost you too much, which is just having some, some false belief for the duration of your life or something like that. Um, as to the, as to the, as to the, you know, to the, to the structure of the argument, I'm not so sure. As a reason for religious faith, I mean, it strikes me as terrible. Um, um, and uh, I, I, yeah, I would have thought it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be considered a very good reason to, to believe. Um, I, I find it hard to see how you could be motivated by that kind of reasoning to have religious faith. I mean, to 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 believe that, that God exists, and it would be, it would be, a, I mean, it would be a strange kind of belief too, right? Because you would be forcing yourself to believe in a sense and believing isn't really like that it would be more like believing in than, than the kind of believing that I was talking about which after all it's just taking something to be true and it's very hard to take something to be true when you don't really believe it um, Pascal's wager is a very interesting uh, concept so obviously Pascal advised or suggested rather that as a wager if people were, were betting in a betting mood that it's better to believe in an afterlife and God and not go to hell, then not believe in that and end up at, on here, in hereafter, if, you, if, it, if there is one, discovering that there is hell and there's God. I don't think that that should be the basis for people's belief, but what I do think is that if anyone's claiming that there is uh, some kind of a danger or, or torment or issue uh, there, that it should motivate people to find out if it was true or not. So, I mean... Someone could say that a meteorite is going to hit the Earth in 2020 or something like this. Um, and, okay, you know, that is something which is a possibility. But generally, people have understood that that's a possibility. And NASA and various space agencies scour the skies to try to identify a meteorite before it does that. Because, obviously, the consequence of ignoring it and that it happens to be true is going to be quite significant. So I suppose what you don't know can um, harm you, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that's the basis for your belief. It should be the basis for you to investigate and to obviously, at least, to ensure yourself against the possibility. Um, I'm kind of a wee bit of a mixture of the two in terms of you should try and find out if it is true, but also I'm pretty sure you'd be in a lot of trouble if you went around kind of like, I totally believe, and then it turned out you didn't. Um, and I would assume um, that if there is a god, that they wouldn't fully accept that you went around saying or outwardly showing it, because I would assume that there would be some way of them knowing that you fully, truly believe <coughs> your heart. Uh, yeah, just briefly, I guess. Um, that guy kind of freaks me out. Um, uh, the, the, the God who only rewards belief, um, or at least the, um, the appearance of belief and the outward loyalty. Uh, I think there's, like, I, I, the God I believe in is, I, I believe in a God of love, and I believe in a God who understands. I think there are ways in which we can have faith and be people who don't honor God and I think there's a way of almost being a faithful atheist in the face of suffering because they actually feel more of the pain that God experiences when he looks at the world than those believers who use faith as an excuse not to feel the suffering of the world. So I don't think God would fall for that trick. Um, uh, I think he's smarter than that and also kinder and more com caring and compassionate than that. So it's not, a, it's not a wager I'm afraid of making. One way or another. Cool. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, is, does anybody else have a question? Uh, okay, yeah, here, then here. So, do you want to go first? Um, you guys think for the panel that there's a difference between a religious life and a spiritual life? And if so, what? Cool. Can we move on to answer? Or? Uh, Adam, I'm going first, cool. yeah. yeah sure. um, I, I think um, sometimes religion gets a bad name. 
Um, and basically all that's happening is people are looking at the external trappings of what is... Like, I think religion is, is spirituality embodied and formalized in a way that it can be passed on from generation to generation. So um, the way in which we live as religious people is the way in which we live out the rhythm of our spirituality. Um, I think sometimes people are distancing, them, distancing themselves from religion because of the bad connotations of that, when there is actually a lot of beauty to the, um, uh, to the idea of it being about it. I think you need the two together. I think you, you can't be, be religious without having a spiritual element to it. But I, I, I often question the sincerity and the integrity of someone who says they're spiritual but not religious because generally it just, it's kind of fluffy and it's not embodied. It's like, I like to think these things, but I wouldn't want to actually live them out. You know? Um, I, I always prefer you know, precision of language so that people don't um, make equivocation fallacies or they, they don't understand what you're trying to say and the word spirituality obviously has been used quite a lot and I, I kind of um, bang my head against the concept to, to understand what does that mean in distinction from someone who might have, be religious of sentiment, religious of heart so I, I kind of define two meanings from that one meaning is that a person internalizes the morals and teachings, uh, the ideas which they imbibe in their religious education, their schools and so on and so forth. So they try to feel as they feel they should be feeling, not just doing something, a superficial action, but to feel, um, feel what they actually believe and do good to others if that's, uh, and feel that goodness inside them, feel a feel, uh, fulfilled human being. So that's, that's one aspect. The other meaning of spirituality, which I think um, I prefer to use uh, to, to be precise, is to, is to basically connect all actions and perceptions of the world with an understanding of a greater meaning behind it. So, in essence, in one way, everything is a spiritual action for a person who believes in, in God, a higher purpose, a higher meaning to, a higher meaning to mankind's existence. So, every, whether you're going to work, you're studying whether you're helping your mother with the chores of the house, uh, whether you're helping the homeless, or you're just uh, reading a book. Every action, if you connect it to this higher meaning, becomes spiritual, even the most mundane and what you might think physical actions. And also, just to kind of shake things up a bit in terms of meaning, people often believe that um, in certain religions, the hereafter or heaven and hell, these are... Uh, spiritual kind of ideas and concepts that will happen in some kind of spiritual or the worldly life. But if you really look at some of the descriptions or, the, or discussions in these religious texts, they're actually kind of physical worlds. They're not spiritual woolly worlds where everyone's floating around like Casper the Friendly Ghost. But rather, these are physical worlds. They just happen to be on a, maybe a different, a different uh, dimensional reality to our one, for example. So people were happy to accept multi multiple universe theory that there's multiple universes out there. And really what I would argue is that in, in the hereafter, these are just other, let's say, realities, which are just as real as our reality, maybe even more so. Uh, so I'll just kind of mix up the idea of spirituality. But I would prefer precision of language, but I know it has a meaning, generally just to mean um, inculcating the emotions which you feel that your religious belief tell you to have, to inculcate them inside yourself and feel them genuinely. Um. Do you remember what the question was? What was the question again? Um, do you think there's a difference between... Oh, a difference. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, there was the difference. Um, I, again, I mean, like my colleague, it, it really depends what, what precisely what meanings you attach to um, spiritual and religious. But on a naive sort of first-pass understanding, I would have thought that, uh, or at least I have the impression that uh, a religious life is one that is grounded in some sort of doctrine, uh, whereas a spiritual life isn't necessarily so. So a religious life could be spiritual. Um, a spiritual life, on this understanding, uh, is not necessarily, uh, is not probably not a religious one. Um, I can see why um, people with a strong religious faith, religious faith, um, feel a bit maybe suspicious and maybe a bit anxious about the notion of being spiritual if it means having some sort of maybe views about the world and having sort of sentiments about the world um, that are metaphysical views but that aren't grounded in some specific kind of doctrine. Um, but, I, I mean, so I, I do think that there could be a difference. I don't see, 
Um, I don't see that the two have to come up. I mean, is Buddhism a spiritual view or a religion? I mean, I, you know, is, some people say, I've heard people saying Buddhism isn't a reli- really a religion, presumably because it doesn't have some kind of doctrinal core or something like that. Um, it's certainly a spiritual viewpoint, and I think it's just as a good a stance to take as any other if you're a spiritual person. Um, so I'm not entirely, yeah, I think there's a difference. I think it's got to do with doctrine, probably. No, I'd be pretty much in agreement with Dan there. <laughs> okay, great, cool. Um, okay, yeah, we have a question up here at the front. Um, some people have uh, laid as a critical as a kind of question, so you just um, believe it. Uh, some of the people have uh, laid criticism against uh, religion uh, that uh, if there uh, is suffering in the world, this sort of disproves God. And then some uh, religious believers have laid a sort of response to this that, um, well, no, because uh, if uh, there was no suffering in the world, that would be perfection. And if there was perfection, we would be drawing too close to God and we could really have free will because being a uh, happy perfection is, uh, you know, um, you know, is, is God. Um, but surely then that raises uh, the further issue that by doing that, um, if God is truly all-powerful, we could have a way of having our free will and being independent of God, but have been free from suffering. How would sort of you sort of get away from that particular problem? Look at me Pass the lead, to lead the way. <laughs> Um, okay, well, as the uh, first head above the parapet <laughs> for this, um, all I will say is all that suffering proves is that you know, the purpose of human life isn't absolute, total pleasure and enjoyment. It's an assumption we made. I would probably say it's an assumption born out of the Enlightenment, um, born out of the idea of liberalism as well, the pursuit of pleasure as, um, well, happiness is the continual pursuit of pleasure as John Locke. Uh, formulated it. But I disagree with John Locke and I disagree uh, with that understanding. Um, pain and pleasure are both parts of our, part of our, our existence and they both serve a purpose. Uh, attraction and aversion are both part of the causality uh, that we're, we're within. And so I think all it proves is an assumption that we have made to believe that the purpose of this life was absolute and complete pleasure, but it's not. In fact, it's something else. And, it's, and then that, the real question is, uh, what is, what is the purpose of life of which pain and pleasure are integral components of? And that is a more interesting question, as opposed to making the assumption about, oh, well, pain exists, therefore God doesn't exist. No, therefore, your, under, your, what, your assumption about your purpose it doesn't, it is not true. But there's a different and more higher purpose, and I think that is um, where the real question should, should lie. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, there's a. I don't. I don't know. Maybe it's part of my my role. Or maybe it's just the stage I'm at in my journey. Um, for me, a bigger question than the theory of it is how we practice this as people. So, me, all, all the justification that I can have to maintain the idea of a good God, but a world in which in, in a world in which suffering exists. And, and try to find a way for those things to be compatible. Um, I can write textbook upon textbook upon textbooks, but until that's embodied in some sort of fleshly way with people, I don't think it makes any difference. And that's that's where I'm. Um, that's where I, I feel like my faith pushes me beyond having an answer to that, though it annoys me. And trying to figure out what does my faith teaching me about li- what does my faith teach me about living in this tension. So, for example, there's this there's this amazing story in John chapter 11 where. Jesus, word comes to Jesus that his, his friend Lazarus is dying. And it comes from his two sisters, uh, Lazarus's two sisters, Mary and Martha. And they, uh, word reaches them and that he delays for four days. And by the time he gets there, Lazarus is dead. And Mary and Martha both come individually to Jesus and they ask, they ask him the ultimate, the kind of, they make this statement and it's the, it's the suffering question. It's, it's, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. And that's, that's what I deal with, with my own suffering. If you had been here, this, this goes against everything I feel should be reality. 
And Jesus' response is the shortest verse in the Bible. And it's, just, it's John 11, chapter 35. Chapter, John 11, verse 35. It just says, Jesus wept. And in that, I find meaning that even though he knows the end of the story, he weeps in the presence of pain. And for me, that teaches me to try and speculate less about why the pain is happening and act more in terms of comforting and having compassion and joining in the silence and the weeping of those who are already broken. Because it's about the practice of your faith that where, that's where the rubber hits the road rather than... I, can answer, I could answer... If I, even if I could answer the question, Mary and Martha couldn't hear it in that moment and I couldn't hear it in my pain. And so for me, it's the embodiment of the faith lived out that is more important. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay, we'll go here, and then we'll go there. So, yeah. um, my question is uh, specific to, to Abdullah, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, so you said uh, we usually believe in something that's usually proven. So for example, like, yeah, energy and stuff is scientifically proven, so that's why we believe in it. And Believing in something probably increases its significance and uh, probably that's the reason we try to reason things out in life. And then you said that, so just to add meaning to life, we can kind of say that God actually exists and everything is like pre-planned and, you know, that things happen the way they usually happen because everything is pre-planned and something like that. So is it that... I mean, it's specific as you said. Is it that you believe in God or are you just telling that God might actually exist? To be more specific. Okay. My, my belief in God... Uh, sorry. Uh, because for me, it's... Uh, at times, it sounds like an assumption that we're just making. Just to add meaning to life, believing in God, this seems more like an assumption. Because well, uh, what I would say is that if... If God doesn't exist, um, we don't have to. Uh, don't believe me. I did that. He must. He must be invented. Sorry. Uh, it's, we don't say that God exists because we need morality. I mean, nihilists would just say that there's no morality. Too bad. That's it. You're not special, and um, uh, no one's special. You're, you just exist, and that's it. And we'll get used to that. So morality is not the, a proof. I don't believe mor- the necessity of morality is a proof of God in, in itself. I'm just stating the point that morality doesn't exist without God because actions become neither good nor bad uh, without God. And that's the point. Because how would you judge what is good and bad? According to what purpose? There's no purpose. So this mad thing just happened. Um, I, I didn't really... What I tried to stress in my presentation with the example of energy was... Well, energy isn't actually proven by science. It's just an, an abstract label or concept to try to explain uh, phenomena that's observed. So, the, the, but what is energy? How do you define it? You won't find any definition of energy in any um, science textbook. It's, it's just a label used um, to express an observation. That they, but where is it? What, what, is it under the microscope? Can you see it under electron microscope? No, you can't find it. So, um, my point is that we believe it because it explains the phenomenon. You understand? So, in my presentation, I put the point that God is the only explanation that consistently explains the observable world that we see. And we are to- humans are totally happy to, to believe in the necessity of things that we can't necessarily see because we detect the, the effects of those things. You know, so black holes, you can't see one, of course, that's why they're called black holes, because they suck light in, but you can see the gravitational effects on nearby stars. That's why you can postulate a black hole exists. And of course, you can see it warps light as, as it passes between a star and Earth. Uh, a black hole will warp light around it. This is how you know it exists. You can't see it directly, though. So if we're happy to do that, then of course I, I'm saying we should be consistent and accept that um, the necessity of... You don't, you know, don't need to call it God if you don't like that word. But the necessity of an a intentioned or, or a willed infinite unlimited force creates everything that exists because that's the only explanation that doesn't fall foul of self-contradiction. And that's my only point. Is that it can be rationally deduced, but just rationally deducing God doesn't mean now that God's just an abstract concept because then it, that has implications. <coughs> so if everything that exists now, because we deduce that there must be a creator and that he, he made everything intentionally, then the question is, well, what does he intend for us and what are we meant to be doing? That's 
then where the question becomes pertinent. Not the way around. I don't say God must exist because I would like to feel my life has meaning. That's not, obviously, the way to argue. The way to actually look at the world is, well, does God exist? If he does, then what does that mean for us? Thank you very much. Um, so, that's a to, to, to Scott and Abdul, uh, how would you respond to the accusation that uh, religion is actually more of a point of not believing in God because religion often doesn't work? Would you perceive to do more damage than does good? I'll go first this time. <laughs> um, give you a break. Uh, uh, I mean, I think historically that's a reasonably fair accusation. Um, I'll just stop there. No, um, <laughs> just walk out. Um, uh, I can see where there is, like, there's a huge amount within my faith in particular that I feel like we have a need to repent of. Um, it doesn't change the beauty that I see within it that still, for me, makes it worth believing in. And in fact, for me, it makes me worth redeeming. But as a result of that, I think that changes the way that I try to live my faith towards other people. So for me, it's not about like trying to... like It's not a pyramid selling scheme where I'm like, you should join in, the benefits are great. Um, it's more of a question of how do I live out and embody this in a way that, that communicates the beauty of what I've discovered within this without making it some kind of, kind of like bait and switch or manipulative thing that, that requires other people to join it. Sometimes that can be the greatest sign of insecurity is that I need other people to believe what I believe in order for me to feel better about believing it. Rather than being able to believe it, live it, and serve those who don't believe it. Like There's a great quote by a guy called Archbishop William Temple. He said, the church is the only organization in the history of the world that exists solely for the benefit of its non-members. Um, and that should be true, but it's not. And yet, for me and, and for those, I think, who are journeying with me, we want to actually try and experiment. What would it look like if that actually was true? And so for me, it's worth redeeming, but that doesn't mean I'm saying everyone should come and join it. Um, for me, it's, it's how I live in, with integrity of you know, what I believed. Um, well, first I'll say, direct some questions towards, towards the atheists or secular events, because uh, they, they, also, they probably have a lot of things they want to, uh, to make clear. But um, in terms of that question you asked, I don't think people blame religion for humans. But really, it's humans that have always been at fault. Um, you'll see this because in every situation, whether atheist, uh, secular, or uh, non-religious, you'll see the exact same phenomenons, uh, de- phenomena develop. Uh, King, King John Un is obviously a communist, technically doesn't believe in God, but yet he's been made a religious figure. Um, Stalin the same. The, the worst and most deadliest religion of them all, surpassing all others, is secularism, uh, secular nationalism, to be, to be um, precise. Under the name of British nationalism, many Irish people were killed because you didn't um, obey a certain flag. You didn't give obedience to a particular flag, a particular concept and idea. You saw yourself as different, and they viewed you as heretics for doing so, the nationalist version of her- heresy, and there was a lot of massacres because of that. That wasn't because of religion, per se. Um, of course, the Northern Ireland issue, everyone cites that was in that religion, but really, again, that's, again, it's just nationalism manifesting itself in different ways. What you'll find is human ego, vanity, um, intolerance, prejudice, will manifest itself according to any excuse that society, of, of any, based on any of the morals or values or beliefs that of, its, of its particular host society. So if a person was born in the Middle East and they obviously had some, they wanted to dominate and, and use power and to get, to get into, obviously, to dominate other people and so on and so forth, they would use what is, what is the most common um, uh, system of, of value in, in there, which is Islam. In Central Africa, where you have uh, was it the anti uh, balaka group, which are massacring Muslims, it was Christianity. It doesn't represent Christianity, but they use it because... Christianity just seemed to be the predominant religion there. Um, in, in China, in Soviet Russia, it was communism. Uh, any particular place a person comes from, they will use the morals, values, ideas of that place, bend it with excuses to, to their own will. It happens consistently. We decry politicians all the time for doing this. They always use high-minded rhetoric to justify colonialism, war, um, greed, and so on and so forth. So we, we give religion a very bad rap when really the real culprit is human beings who would do the same thing under any system, any belief system, or lack thereof. Great, thank you. And um, we have, I think we have, 
we have time for one or two more questions. So, okay, so we'll take that you then you. So if you want to go first, yeah. All right, sorry, you were just saying um, that uh, you say the evil seems to arise from human nature, or say the version of it is teaching. But would the same be said for the brother's world? Hmm. As in arising from human nature, just um, okay. Well, um, what I'll say can the same be said of God that evil arises from God? <coughs> well, if God doesn't really have a preconditioned nature. I mean, we are obviously yeah. creatures of nature. Sorry. You make human nature evil. Yeah. You're saying that it, you are saying your point that religion is corrupted by evil within human nature. Yeah. The human nature is responsible for religious wars. Yes. The good comes from human nature. Oh, the good rather. comes from human, human nature. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, yeah, that's true. People, there'll be some people who will be giving and kind to others, no matter what religion they are. You know, and that's what they're born with. They feel empathy. Some are sociopaths and they have difficulty um, connecting with humans, and some obviously become psychopaths. However, what I would say is that the point of, I would say, the point of religion rather, but um, what religion does, its effect, is really to be counterintuitive. So. Uh, being rational and reasonable, you would you know, save your money and spend it on either further investment to increase your wealth or spend it on things which uh, you want. But to literally give it away to a homeless person or beggar who will literally benefit you, you, know, you don't foresee, foresee the future, it will benefit you in the future at all. Or to forgive your enemy when your enemy is out to get you is counterintuitive to what we think a reasonable person would do. Um, you know, the, have you heard of the... Um, uh, the, was it the economic, uh, the human, the, the human economic, sorry, what is it called? The economic man model. The economic man model is a model used in, in capitalist economic systems to understand how humans would act. The model is that a human being would only act based on selfish interests and would only either spend money to invest it or for utilities and goods and services. But it cannot encompass the idea that a human being would literally give all their money away to charity and live a pauper because they feel they want to follow maybe a higher ideal. And it is counterintuitive. I mean, who do that? Right? But that's the point of religion, is, in a way, is to be counterintuitive, to tell you not to follow law of the jungle instincts if, if you do follow it. So, in a way, religion is not for... Religion, uh, in, in its morality aspects, doesn't really benefit people who are naturally good, but it's actually there for those who are bad, who don't have that desire in them, or who are selfish, or who are prideful, which is perhaps most of us, who have, have these, you know... Uh, these whisperings, as we say, it's for, it's for us at those times when we are tested to tell us to do the counterintuitive uh, solution, which is uh, don't lie to get self, for your self-interest. Don't lie on your CV to get a job, <laughs> even though you know, and most students probably will, because you know that you're in a competitive market. But religion tells you don't do it, even though, materially speaking, it would be, it would be beneficial for you to do it. But it's wrong. And that's the point of um, religion, really. It actually helps those who desire to do something bad, give them a reason not to. No, it's just, humans are instinctively social animals. We don't exclusively act in self-interest. It compromises a large part of our human nature as well. So that could be used as a factor for a naturalistic explanation of morality that can be developed. Yeah, but what about when humans, according to human nature, engage in wars, violence, uh, killing and lying. I mean, who's to say that's not human nature because humans seem yeah, to be doing this. So I think, I think you better. Oh. I'm going to move on to the next question, if that's okay. Thank you very much for your question. Um, so it was over here, I think. Yeah. Um, how would you describe miracles in the light of religion and science? And uh, there are some miracles which can't be proven by science, can't be proven by religion, and at the same time, there are miracles which can be proven by science but can't be proven by religion. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, just generally, I'm not great at explaining in the aftermath of it and um, the joy. Maybe this is my get out of jail free card. Um, my approach to a more mystical Christianity leaves me not having to figure out an answer to that. I am open to the idea of the miraculous, but I'm also deeply skeptical of it. Not because of the idea of the miraculous happening, but because of our human tendency to use that to control other people or to manipulate other people. That makes me, it, it kind of. Most of the way, my, my own personal religious history has 
has seen things be described as miraculous in order to convince or to manipulate or do a, a bunch of different things as a result. So I'm someone who's deeply skeptical but open to it, but don't. Um, but, I, but in terms of the scientific and the religious explanations of it, I have neither. Yeah, would you like to respond? Or would you, Dan, would you like to respond after? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, I said, if anyone has the following questions, please direct them, include the, <laughs> the non theist on the panel, because they've, they've been left out and they need to obviously be part of the thing. Um, but as for um, so your question about miracles and science and so on, um, what I would say is that the thing is, if you already discard the possibility of miracles, then there's nothing that could ever be shown to you that you'd understand as miraculous. You could see uh, Jesus, or Isa alayhi salam, as we, as we say in, in, uh, in from Islamic, his name in Islam, he could be healing a, a leper right in front of you, healing the blind, and instantly the person can see, instantly the leprosy is gone. And if you didn't believe in miracles, you'd say, oh, it's, a new, it's an interesting new medical technique, which uh, Jesus has mastered. <laughs> you know, please teach us in our hospitals. I mean, if you already negate the possibility of miracles, there's nothing that could be presented to you. However, I would say that the truth doesn't always need someone to part the, red sea, the, the sea in front of you or to raise the dead in front of you for it to be, for it to be truth to be made manifest to you. As I said, belief in the existence of God doesn't require us to see a miracle Unless we define miracle as something which is an act of God, then I would argue then, well, actually, then the universe itself is a miracle. <laughs> and therefore, perhaps, miracles do prove existence of God. So it depends what you define as a miracle and whether you are prepared to accept the possibility uh, of miracles occurring or not. Um, but as for the issue of science, this idea that science and religion, and I think it was implicit in your question, of this kind of uh, contradiction is a very recent, uh, perhaps I would say, spin on history. Um, Obviously, in Islamic history, the, 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 the golden age of science was when religion was brought into society, not excluded from it. But also in Europe uh, as well, the, there was an institution that was building the first universities, universities in Europe, uh, teaching the sciences and uh, spreading knowledge, and it was the Catholic Church. Let's, let's be honest about that. The European Dark Ages actually wasn't so dark. If, you, if anything, the only explanation for the Dark Ages was the fall of the Western Roman Empire to German barbarians. Well, obviously, not, they're not going to be a, the most advanced civilization after that. So, of course, Eastern Roman Empire, uh, who didn't fall to barbarians, was still scientifically very advanced teaching philosophy in their schools. So, there isn't this conflict between religion and science. Um, as I said, if there were two goldfish in a goldfish bowl, scientifically, all they could prove was the water around them and the constraints of their universe. But rationally speaking, the two goldfish might dedu would deduce that they don't know what's outside that goldfish bowl, but they know for definite there is an external reality that calls the goldfish bowl to come into existence. They could deduce that without needing a scientific experiment. So rationality, science, they all have their place in, in religion, and they're not uh, contradictory. Okay, and then would you like to respond? Yeah, um, I, I, first of all, I, I would um, agree again with Abdullah about uh, if, if miracle means act of, act of God, then of course, um, as an... As an atheist, you will say there are, no, there are no miracles and there haven't been any miracles. There couldn't be because there are something that doesn't exist. Um, but if you, if you think about miracles just as improbable events, maybe very improbable events, then it, it's always possible to have competing hypotheses about why, uh, why an improbable event occurred. And one hypothesis might be that it occurred because something, some intelligent being brought it about, and another hypothesis might be that it was merely uh, a matter of chance. And which of those hypotheses you prefer will depend on which you think is the simpler and better explanation, and it will depend on other background assumptions that you have, which comes back to my point in my sort of opening spiel that um, nothing like the occurrence of an improbable event uh, is going to uh, convince uh, a person without faith to have faith, uh, nor is it going to convince, nor are merely improbable events going to convince people to have, uh, not to have faith. Uh, and so I, I do think that it's worth mentioning the uh, kind of fine-tuning argument which, which Abdullah mentioned as well, the sort of cosmological type arguments. The, 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 so one <laughs> acknowledged very improbable event is that we should find ourselves in an ordered universe. Um, the chances that uh, the 
physical, the, the chance that the physical constants should have come out such that we live in an ordered universe, a universe that doesn't immediately collapse or die, eat death, or something else, are, are so small. Uh, it's, 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 and it requires scientific explanation, right? So this is, that we live in an ordered universe is incredibly unlikely. And it's a, a very well-known and very good argument for religious belief that uh, given the unlikelihood that we find ourselves in an ordered universe, we should have some sympathy with the proposition that the universe was created to be like this, was caused to be like this by something, by some being with the, who could intend it to be like this. And actually, I agree, even as an atheist, that the fact that you find yourself in an ordered universe, given that improbability, and maybe let's not assume the multiple worlds hypothesis just for the purposes of this, if, if, you, if, you, if you just look at this universe in isolation, then that should raise your credence that there is a creator. Uh, but the problem with that argument is that um, if you start with a very low credence that a creator, it's just going to raise it. It's not going to make you believe necessarily. Um, so if I, if I already think it's improbable that there's, a, that there's a divine being, then the fact that I find myself in an ordered universe given the improbability of that, might make me think, well, it's a bit more likely that there's a divine being, but it's not going to push me to anything like, towards anything like belief. So, again, I mean, I'm coming back to that point that I made at the very beginning. Arguments like that, arguments concerning miracles or the cosmological argument, they're not going to shift someone from one perspective to another. Um, and I just think that's the nature of the debate, actually. Um, if I just might add, the argument I, I, I kind of put forward it wasn't that. I wasn't if you, quite. If you, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you roll a dice many times and it keeps coming up as one, that must be um, miraculous. My real question was who's rolling the dice and why is the dice being rolled? So we can talk about, oh, isn't it interesting that this universe seems to have the right measurements for life? Yeah, but where's these universes coming from in the first place? What's creating these universes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a more fundamental question, is, which. Yeah. Um, so, well, people tend to ignore when, when uh, looking at design arguments or cosmological arguments. Do you want to go with Kat? Would you like to add anything? Uh, I would just be quite skeptical, skeptical rather, of um, miracles in that I would like to think that everything can be proven. We might not necessarily have the means to prove everything at the moment, but eventually I reckon we could be proven, whether that's as a result of... Um, like, if you're religious and you want to argue that... Um, if, you, if you're willing to accept the explanation that science gives and you think there's a deeper meaning for the fact that you know all of those things came together and thus it happened, that's cool. But in terms of whether it's... For me, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree that there's always a complete reason behind it. I think everything can be explained. Like, it doesn't mean it's not interlinked if you're of that persuasion but it wouldn't exactly push me to believe the fact that it does, if there is a God, that it does exist. Cool, great. So we're just going to have one last question. Um, so here, if you'd like to ask. So my question is uh, for Dan and Lady. Uh, Cass. Uh, Cass. 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 <laughs> Cass. Ah, sorry. Cass. Uh, so Dan, as an atheist, uh, and yourself as someone who does not believe in a specific religion, uh, do you believe in the concept of morality and by extension a moral compass? And if yes, then uh, what do you think defines that, uh, if not religion? Um, um, ab absolutely. <laughs> I do believe uh, that, there is, um, that there is right and wrong and, and, and good and bad actions and, and, and that. I, I don't... Um, see that there's that it follows from that at all that uh, or that that having believing in a moral reality requires religious belief whatsoever. Um, there's a, a famous, um, I mean, relatively famous puzzle in um, in one of Plato's dialogues um, where Socrates discusses whether uh, things are good because God says they are or God says they are so because they're good. Um, and neither seems to provide an explanation, right? If things are antecedently good, and God simply says what's good, um, then the morality precedes uh, the deity. If something is good because God says it's good, well, then there's a question about 
what makes what what it, why is the mere testimony of God make the thing good in the first place? Um, now I'm not saying that's not a puzzle that a person of faith can't resolve, um, but I, I I feel like it points to the fact that these are two independent things. As it happens, from my part, I'm a consequentialist. I think that what's good is what maximizes well-being. Um, the, a, a right action is one that maximizes well-being, and a bad action is one that doesn't do so. Uh, is it always possible to work out what maximizes well-being? No, well, of course not. Um, the idea that what's good is what maximizes well-being doesn't seem to require any uh, faith, religious faith whatsoever. Okay, uh, can I just help? Would you like to answer that? Um, I would argue that it's just basic human nature. It's human nature to be nice and it's human nature to be bad, but just being nice benefits us that little bit more. Like it's like less beneficial to go around murdering everyone because in the end, you know, you could find that if you murder enough people there's not enough spread of ideas, blah blah blah, you can't learn. That sort of thing. Um uh it just it benefits us more basically and I would wager that the way we define good is the things that benefit us most and that just might be human nature. I think we're going to have to wrap up now, but thank you very much for your question. Um, so on that note, I'd just like uh, to ask um, the audience to give a round of applause for all of the speakers, and thank you very much for your time. <laughs> yeah, uh, on behalf of UC Philosophy Society and um, the Islamic, Islamic Society, um, thank you very much for attending. We really appreciate um, people coming out to support these kinds of events.